good evening everyone um, you can see during this covid 19 period uh, the internationally there has been a rise in domestic violence every few days we get a counselor or two giving a call and saying that uh, they are sharing their counseling number and that there are persons who are approaching them so uh, domestic violence which has is obviously as re real and as long as civil society has existed has come in it into its own in india as a separate enactment in 2005 which was uh, came into force in October 2006. Now, it's giving rise to what the Constitution envisages and protects under Article 14, equality before law, Article 15, which says uh, equality for men and women under the law. So the Domestic Violence Act is really to a step in that direction to give reality to what is envisaged by our constituent constitution and our constitution constituent makers now uh, during this present period the ncw has in fact given a helpline number and uh, that is something which can be shared later with everyone which is a whatsapp number in case anyone has an emergency the number of cases uh, before the ncw the complaints from first week march till end march have increased exponentially in fact they become twice the number and this is not just a problem in India, it's a worldwide problem. Let's look at the next slide. It will give you a sense of what is happening all over the world. The United Na uh, Nations Secretary General says, I urge all governments to put women's safety first as they report and as they respond to the pandemic. Why has it become so real and why is it so important? Is because people who are closeted together in a lockdown situation, whether it be men, women, whether it be friends, whether it be family members, there's bound to be greater, there is likelihood to be greater friction or possibility of friction but in cases where there may be histories of those men's parents having or father having been abusive or there being a history or a background of aggressiveness that aggressiveness can get accentuated in china a beijing based ngo dedicated to Combating violence against women has said that there is a surge in calls for its helpline help since February. As you know, in China, this problem started or was became vocal by end December of 2019. And when the government has locked down cities in Hubei province, then the outbreaks epidemic. Now, Domestic violence rates in France, South Africa, Australia have all increased manifold. There is a 75% increase in online searches with regard to domestic violence in Australia. In Spain, where the lockdown rules are strict, there is again a problem which is happening. So we are seeing internationally, there is a huge problem happening in the domestic violence field. And this is something where women do need protection and 
The best has to be done to provide helplines to women, to provide succor to women, to provide counselors to women. Now, what's special about the prevention of do Domestic Violence Act 2005 coming into force in 2006? What's special about this? What is special about this as compared to, say, maintenance to women under Section 24 of the Hindu Marriage Act? Maintenance to women under Section 18 and 23 of the Hindu Maintenance and Adoption Act, which is HAMA. What is special about this? What is special about this is one, it is a single window act. It provides relief or is aiming at providing relief in a single window for various problems, whether it be child custody, whether it be maintenance, whether it be right to residence, whether it be a shared household, and we'll dilate on each of these further. But uh, what is special about it is the fact that it cuts across all religions, all races, all communities, all castes. To that extent, it is somewhat similar with regard to maintenance under 125. Now, question are what are the allied acts which protect women? The allied acts which protect women or the enactments under the criminal law are 498A of IPC, which is cruelty to women. That, of course, is bound in by the definition of what is cruelty under the Indian Penal Code. And that cruelty has to be either connected with dowry demands or connected where a woman's health is affected by members of the family of the husband. Uh, then next is section 304A of the IPC. What is section 304B of the IPC, sorry, not A. 304B deals with dowry deaths. Now, both these are criminal enactments, whereas the Domestic Violence Act though available to be a pro, uh, the person to be approached is the magistrate's court, is really a civil law remedy. Can we come to the next uh, slide? The next one after this. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a civil law remedy, and that has come in several judgments of the Supreme Court. One is Savita Bhanot, the other is Puni Maran, which is a judgment by Justice Sikri's bench. See, the whole issue used to be, is it a criminal law? Is it a civil law? Because although the, the rules envisage the procedure of the sim, criminal procedure court, the rules envisage that you will follow the summary procedure as given under criminal law, but it doesn't really follow that if there is an infraction, there is a rest. It is only in case of contempt that there is a rest. So what is it? It's a single window civil remedy to a woman who may be subject to physical, mental, psychological, sexual, assault violence. That's what is laudatory about this. Uh, earlier, women would be running first for maintenance, then they would be running out the Guardians Act for custody, then they would be rushing to a criminal court under 498A IPC. And sometimes you didn't really need to go to 498A. You didn't really need to invoke criminal law. Because one important aspect is that the moment that you invoke criminal remedies and there's a question of bail, not bail, then the possibility of reconciliation, if at all a woman is looking at that, would become almost impossible. 
the civil law, which is the Domestic Violence Act, however, does not have those penal consequences of criminality, of sending a person behind bars. And that is why it is a more palatable remedy for resolution of fights, resolution of disputes, of mediation, of resolution. And that's why at every step in matters of this nature, an attempt is made by the courts to try and resolve the matter. Now, what are recent developments? Since it's a fairly decent, uh, recent act, it's only a 15-year-old act, every day there is new legislation interpreting this act. There, is, there are some expressions in the enactment which have left room for much interpretation. One of the aspects is what is the domestic relationship under Section 2 of the Domestic Violence Act? Second, who can be a respondent? Can a respondent only be a male or can it also be a female? Third, can it, what is a shared household under Section 2? Is a person in a domestic relationship, if they are not sharing a household, if they are not sharing a kitchen, if they are not joint in food mess worship? So this was one aspect of interpretation. And what the other aspect in definition was when it described respondent being a male relative. The courts have interpreted that it can be against a relative of the husband, male partner, because one of the important aspects, and in this sense also, the Domestic Violence Act is, um, is very progressive, is that it envisages a live-in relationship. What kind of live-in relationship? We shall discuss in the slides which will come henceforth. Uh, now, um, the question then is, are these proceedings, can they overlap with 125? Can they overlap with Section 25 of Guardians, Guardian and Wards Act? Can they overlap with Section 24 and 25 of Hindu Marriage Act? which gives interim maintenance and permanent maintenance. My view is that we, our legal system, is already so overburdened that even though they are independent proceedings, if relief of maintenance is granted under one window or under one roof, then the other remedies should either adopt the same or they should be given up. It cannot be that a person goes forum hunting from 125 to section 12 and 17, 18, 19 of DV Act to go under Hindu Marriage Act. Because if we have to ensure that legal remedies are available to all, then those remedies should not be duplicated, replicated, or they should not be forum hunting. So while they are separate remedies, the, the, the aspect, and this is discussed subsequently in a judgment in one of the slides called Rachna Kathuria, I'll come to that later, where Justice Dhingra of the Delhi High Court says, if you've got relief under one, you shouldn't get relief under another one. Now, there is a mixed view on that. Um, the final word has yet to come from Supreme Court in its own way, although in one of my cases, the Supreme Court did pronounce upon it, but it said that the earlier proceeding would have to be looked at, and you would go back to that court if, if there was a change of circumstances. So suppose someone's earning 
100 rupees, later he's earning 200 rupees, and you're going for maintenance, and thereafter for enhancement of maintenance, then the change in circumstance should, the court, you should be compelled to go back to that same very court and ask for enhancement in a change of circumstances rather than forum hunting in several fora. Now, what's the definition of matrimonial home? Uh, before I discuss what's the definition of matrimonial home, what's very important is this is the first time there was statutory interpretation of matrimonial home which came in India. When I came back to, England, to India from the UK and I was asked by the Ministry of uh, 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 Women and Child, what was one of the reliefs that I would think which is most important, I said, well, a right in a matrimonial home, a right to residence in a matrimonial home. What takes away most of the salary of any person if they don't have a house is a roof over a person's head. What is so expensive and cuts out a major, major part of one's income is your residence. So once it becomes a chunk of a major chunk of what is a the manner in which a person disposes their income or maintenance or alimony, then a right to live somewhere, whether it be in the matrimonial home, whether it be in a place which is similar to a matrimonial home, whether it be a division of the home, whether it be that the husband is asked to provide if the wife is not able to provide, whether it be to see that if a wife has a place to live, then is that enough? Or would that suffice? Or would she still be able to have hold of her husband's home? That concept of matrimonial home is defined under Section 70 of the Domestic Violence Act. Section 17 said a woman has a right in a shared household at slash matrimonial home. It doesn't use the word matrimonial home. She uses shared household, provided she's lived there or lives there or has lived there for some time, whether it be her own home, husband's home, uh, sorry, husband's home or a home which is a joint home. Now, uh, the language used is slightly imprecise and that's why whether it was or was not it's an important provision so it would have been subject to a lot of interpretation a bench of justice kaju in uh, a judgment uh, which uh, has been referred to herein says that it cannot be that a person has a fleeting visit to a home and calls it their matrimonial home. Now what, and therefore it narrowed the definition to be more realistic. Now subsequent to that, there were two judgments, both of which I was the counsel, Dr. Kavita Chaudhary, who, uh, who filed a case against her daughter-in-law. She was a heart patient, her heart was uh, working less than 50%, I think about 40%. She had various uh, medical ailments. Shumita uh, Barun Nahar, where the father-in-law was 80, 85, and was again having multiple health issues. And there were constant complaints by the daughter-in-law and within the household, some hundreds of complaints. And the court said, is the husband who has to provide for her. She cannot, a person doesn't have a right to live in the house of parents-in-law, particularly if those parents-in-law do not keep good health. And that's why these two judgments, Barun Nahar, Parul Nahar, 
as well as uh, Ivneet Singh Kavita Chaudhary. There is one other judgment which is referred here, Shumita Didi, where um, um, a, a bench of the Delhi High Court Division bench said, assume somebody is in government service, he's transferred. You can't say I have a right to live there. So Shumita Didi Sandhu said, you may against the husband have a right to, of residence, but you don't have a right of residence in that particular home, whatever the circumstances may be. It has to be a realistic right. The definition of shared household matrimonial home was pruned and recently in two judgments, which you'll see further in the next two slides, uh, are, are relevant uh, after this. Uh, is uh, One is uh, a judgment is Neha Uja Satish Ahuja, where the father-in-law got an order of eviction. The Delhi High Court has dealt with it differently, saying that the son should make provision, but son may not be a party, or son may be a party, but he may not have a right of residence in that home. He may have moved to a different matrimonial home. In any case, this matter has now gone to Supreme Court. It's pending a notice has been issued in the Supreme Court on, on this interpretation, which the Delhi High Court has placed, because there are two other judgments which uh, are relevant, which is Preeti Satija and Amnita Arora, which are also pertinent, where the court said the husband should be able to misuse the interpretation to oust a person. So the court has to see the facts of each case, what the wife, how well the wife is earning, how well the husband's earning, whether the property belongs to the husband, doesn't belong to the husband, whether the property is a property owned exclusively by a father-in-law, mother-in-law, in which case both the husband is a licensee, his wife is the wife of a licensee, and that's what has happened. Now going further, question is, in the meantime, there is a Senior Citizens Act. And the question is now of the interplay of acts of the rights of a senior citizen with the rights of the, uh, the daughter-in-law. So it can, a senior citizen say, I want to live in peace. And this remedy is available before the district magistrate in the DC court. So the question under that is, would, how would you balance the rights uh, uh, between a mother-in-law, father-in-law, and a daughter-in-law if you see the, on one hand the Senior Citizens Act on the other hand, the Domestic Violence Act. And the court has sought to, uh, to balance it in a judgment by, again, the Delhi High Court by Justice Pratibha Singh. And that judgment basically says that the husband would have to provide. So the question here would be, in an interplay between the rights of a father-in-law, mother-in-law, and the daughter-in-law and son. Even if the husband has to provide, the person has to seek remedy under the civil law, under the Domestic Violence Act, under the Hindu Marriage Act, or any other law, but that cannot bring the interplay of the Domestic Violence Act in it. The remedy has to be by the wife in such a manner that the husband would provide for her if she is not employed and if she is not working. Now, in so far as um, this act is concerned, as I've already said, 498A and the fact that it is a non-available provision 
was open to misuse. And this is another reason why the DV Act, which is a civil remedy, is ameliorating the cause of both men and women as it makes, it makes it possible for them to sit together to resolve matters. And if not sit together, at least in every case, even if no criminality is made out, there will not be a use of 498A in case it's not called for. Can we have the next slide, please? So uh, while we uh, look at this act, one of the aspects I want to point out is that there is a provision for a report by a social worker to the court. This report was supposed to be a very realistic report, which a social worker attached to the court, a psych a sociologist would make a home study report. In actual practice, it has not been very su successful and therefore has not paid the dividends that was sought. When the act was originally enacted, it was envisaged that relief under this act would be given within 60 days. But all the courts are burdened and therefore, even though the it was visualized that the court could form its own procedure. And therefore, in the initial years, in 2006, 2007, in several of my cases, one was with the Majadeja, there was another Bulbuldhar. The courts gave us relief without going into evidence, saying it can form its own procedure. So it'll decide on the basis of evidence. But over the years, the court started saying that this was a violation of natural justice. It can't be done. You have to give a right of cross-examination. Slowly and slowly, the entire, the entire natural justice, uh, one relief after the other remedies came in. And the, the result is that there are some cases where a first date is given after three months or six months. Courts, magistrates' courts, are burdened with their various police stations as well as with DV Act cases. And once they are so burdened, there are some courts which are exclusively deciding DV cases, but there are many courts which have DV cases as well as uh, uh, criminal uh, cases of their various police stations. Now, in such a burden court, how, how do you envisage that a court can give speedy justice? But the Domestic Violence Act was enacted only for this intention. It had to give speedy justice. This is something which it is failing to. So one of the aspects is ex parte relief in a right of residence, in matters of child custody interim ex parte reliefs are being given. But there will be cases where a judge says that, sorry, you don't have enough proof that you are living in this place. Maybe you were living, maybe you've been thrown out. So court may not give you interim relief. The husband avoids service. In the meantime, he ensures he is able to throw you out. Or a notice is given, which in fact, uh, the whole matter is adjourned for a period of three months, six months. This is making virtually the right of a person in fractures. So although this is a beautiful act, the enactment has many wonderful qualities and can give much good relief, but its implementation after the courts have slowly brought in and fairly so, natural justice provisions, because of, no one can be condemned unheard, be man or woman. The result is that the provision has become as dilatory as other civil law remedies. One of the reasons why people take recourse to 498 a IPC is because it's a quick remedy. Surely that should not be a reason. Our recourse to relief
should be not because we can't get relief under a civil law, therefore somebody files a criminal case. What is necessary is quick, urgent relief with regard to maintenance, with regard to child custody under the law. So can we go on to the next slide? Uh, So this I've just spoken about. This is the judgment by on 29th November 2019, as recent as that. And it's still not been tested in Supreme Court. We don't know whether the matter will go to Supreme Court. But surely, because the rights of senior citizens and the rights of individuals under Domestic Violence Act are both uh, to be balanced, to be looked at. Question is, can senior citizens avail their remedy and would a person who wants recourse under the DV Act have to approach the court and get their relief independently, separately, with the domestic violence court giving some interim relief pending uh, the adjudication. The Question is, this is something which is bound to come to the Supreme Court sooner or later. Now, when, while we talk of uh, the, the, uh, this relief of right of residence, I was earlier talking about living relationships and whether a person in a living relationship has a right to alimony, maintenance. Can they come under the DV Act? Yes, they can. Now, what is that living relationship? The section describes it a relation akin to marriage. So the courts, a bench of Justice Kaju and Justice Thakur, interpreted this in uh, a judgment where, and subsequently also in Indra Sarma. Uh, so there were two judgments on this issue. And what was said was that suppose somebody, and there was a lot of furor on this also, because they said, suppose somebody is having a fleeting relationship. Suppose somebody is just uh, a nightstand, so to say. They can't come and say we have a domestic relationship. So the relationship should be such they hold themselves out for, to society as being akin to spouses. They must be of the legal age to marry. They must be entitled and qualified to marry. They must voluntarily cohabit, go out together, act socially together. It's not, and the court uses the expression concubine which was uh, taken amiss by uh, several people. But the intention of the court was not this. The intention of the court was, did the person intend to have a relationship akin to marriage, which is the definition under the act, that is a living relationship. Now, if you compare it to the UK and to some other countries, they say, that you should be like a common law marriage for two years. So it is not something which should hurt our sensibilities if the court is saying that both should be eligible to marry. For example, a man, in, a man abandons his wife, starts living with another woman, or starts going for a day to somebody else. Now, question is, would you deprive the wife of her rights? Would this person have equal rights? Or should it be a relationship akin to marriage? Uh, should we go by the Hindu Marriage Act, which says monogamy? Should it, and therefore, it should be a relationship where both should be eligible to marry? So in that sense, these two judgments by, this, uh, by the Supreme Court 
including Indra Sharma, which was a judgment by Justice Radha Krishnan's bench, and the other judgment by Justice Thakur and Kaju, both judgments really spoke with one voice on this aspect. Now, if we go on further and see what are the rights with regard to uh, custody. Let's look at custody. Let's look at, I've already spoken about Rachna Kathuria, Ramesh Kathuria, and the fact, now let's look at maintenance first and then custody. Now maintenance, <clears throat> there are, uh, the Delhi High Court has given a series of ju judgments uh, 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 which are Puneet Sahani, Kusum Lata 1 and Kusum Lata 2, where it's sort of set out a, virtually a long 20, 30 page table where both parties have to give affidavits. Now those affidavits have to stay, say aspects which are not really covered under Section 24. Some are covered by 25 of Hindu Marriage Act, some are not covered under 24 of the Hindu Marriage Act. Several are not covered by 125 of the uh, um, CRPC. But it's become this norm to file this income affidavit, as it's called, and then determine whether a person is entitled to maintenance and what amount. Now, 125 says a person should be completely destitute, unable to maintain themselves. This is all 1975 Supreme Court judgment on that. The other aspect is, is that, is the person who is claiming maintenance, are they having sufficient means? Is the person who is claiming maintenance, and this has evolved in the last 10 to 15 years, is the person, and one of the judgments is Philip versus Philip, there is also Mamta Jaiswal, we'll just come to those, that's there, Mamta Jaiswal and, uh, and uh, Shelicha. So Mamta Jaiswal was a Madhya Pradesh High Court judgment, which basically, if you see, basically says, that we are not supposed to get an army of idle people. Therefore, if it's a woman who claims equality, is qualified, educated, able to work, was working, has not given up work because she's had a child, has not given up work because of idiosyncrasies, then such a person should be entitled to maintenance. But if she is not working or has become idle for no good reason, then she should not get maintenance. The Supreme Court has, in a recent judgment of 2018, which is Shailija was Obama, said, look, it's not just your ability to work. It's also you're, you're having a job. And if you are actually earning or are actually able to work but are giving up a job, so there'll be a distinction in those two cases. Uh, and the court said that if a person's capable of working, not working, maybe not being able to get a job, the person should be able to approach the court and get maintained. Now, uh, when we go on further, we see what should be that quantum. So the Delhi High Court in Anurikita Sandeep Ora says, 2004 judgment by Justice Vikram Jit Sen says, you make it like a pie, each person has a piece of the pie, but the person who's working gets two pieces, can be a little more of that pie. And accordingly, everyone should get a right to maintenance. Uh, so if the husband has 
say one child, the wife has one child, then the husband, if he's working, the wife's not working, the husband will get three-fifths of the pie and the wife will get two-fifths of the pie. But the Supreme Court recently, in another judgment, has said that normal maintenance should be between 25% and 30%. In Kalyan D. Chaudhary versus Rita Chaudhary, which is a 2017 judgment of the Supreme Court. And that, so far, is the latest word on the issue with regard to quantum of maintenance. Coming now to the next issue, which is with regard to suppression of facts. A very interesting judgment of the Supreme Court, not cited here, but referred to, I think it's Justice Vadwal's judgment, uh, where uh, the court says, you will see suppression both by husband and wife in most cases of maintenance. Now one is a a mild, mild non-disclosure. The other question is blatant falsehood. The question is, where should the courts be placed if there is suppression of facts? Should they reject the maintenance? Should they grant some maintenance? Should they not look at the suppression as long as there is discovery? So this is a very vexed question. The courts have spoken with various voices. Um, in one case, it says maintenance should be reduced, P. Suresh. Then another case, the Delhi High Court has said if there is suppression by the wife. She should not be granted any maintenance. And so on and forth. It's a vexed question, as I said. But in my own view, if there is clear suppression, then the question is, should a person who comes to the court with unclean hands be entitled to relief? Now, going on from this, I hope I've not exceeded my time. Uh, now, as far as adultery is concerned, 125.4 CRPC is very clear. Person, even for interim maintenance, only under 125 CRPC, section 24 is different. It envisages that adultery would be determined later, but um, uh, 125 4 says even for interim maintenance under CRPC, if there is some strong fact bringing out an allegation of adultery, then question of maintenance, it should be refused. Now, the last aspect is child custody. In it, The act is not happily worded with regard to child custody, almost envisages that the custody should be with the mother. This is not in keeping with the law commission, which is more and more say, speaking in terms of joint custody. Today, all over the world, in the democratic world, with fathers playing a major role in child rearing and in, uh, in helping with the child, there are joint parenting agreements. And in those, and with women working, the question then would be, can the act speak in such a gender, insensitive language, even if it's insensitive to the man. The, the, therefore, while the Law Commission 237th report talks of joint custody and joint parenting, while the uh, Bombay, there are some guidelines made by Bombay and they've been, they have been circulated in all the courts in, in Maharashtra as well as in Madhya Pradesh, and which are a guide, then the question is child custody. Should it only be with the wife? Should 
it be with the husband? Can a husband get visitation if custody is given to the wife under the Domestic Violence Act? These are issues which the language of the act does not help. Now, uh, this is one aspect which becomes, which is also important. So we've dealt with maintenance, we've dealt with shared household, we've shared, dealt with protection orders we haven't dealt with, but there are protection orders. Somebody can't call you, they can't speak to you, they can't uh, come to your house. This is a very important protection. Such protection orders are standard in the Western world, but may or, but have been introduced in India only with the Domestic Violence Act. And therefore, that is a step in the right direction. Now, coming lastly to the fact that this is not a gender neutral act in other countries. In India, only women can av avail this act. It's protection of women from Domestic Violence Act. Uh, but in the US, in the UK, it is a gender neutral act. Is India right for it? Is India not right for it? To my mind, at the moment, India is still not right for it because the enactment, unless we have a more gender equal society, we cannot have an enactment which is gender neutral. So the need of the R is that you need to bring about some element of equality. And COVID-19 is again an example. You need to have an enactment which is gender sensitive in India for the moment. There are examples that at least one out of every three women are some point or the other victim of domestic violence or have made complaints of domestic violence. That's huge. That's an extremely high percentage. And in today's day, all over the world, we have seen that this phenomena is so bad that even the UN Sec Secretary General has asked or made a plea for people to protect women in their households. Having said this, all that we can say is, we are at a very, very sensitive time. We are at a time where we need to take care and nurture our fellow human beings, leave alone our wives, our soulmates, our life mates. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Uh, whatever questions, Garb? Ma'am, we'll start the questions in a bit. Thank you so much. It has been an enlightening session. We have, like, I would like to announce that a record breaking. We have 100 people in the room. We have been getting calls parallelly. We are live on Facebook with you, with a lot of people. It's, it's amazing. Everyone's asking for the PPT. So everyone who's been asking for the PPT, we will share it along with the link of the video it will go live on youtube in about a day and two on lci you can follow them they will update everything do not worry so ma'am we have a couple of questions let me see if any live questions are there yes ma'am so right now we have it from sunil motwani he says what if the husband was staying in the wife's place and he moves out what happens in that scenario um, see the if the husband moves out of the wife's place, there is no issue because ultimately the wife cannot, wife can at worst seek a protection that the husband should not return home. Uh, because if at all she is a victim of any of the domestic violence, whether abusive or physical or psychological or economic, and if those cases are there, then she can, if she needs, she can ask for a protection order saying he shouldn't come back to my home. That's envisaged under Section 19. 
and uh, adding on to the question, Sunil has just a slight modification. He says, what if he's left the house and after that work, the wife files a DV case against him and his family? What should one do in that scenario? So was his family living with him at no. the home? If no. his family wasn't living, then they weren't in the domestic relationship with them. It's a person with whom you are living in a domestic relationship. So if only he was living, then the case can continue against him and he can ask for his family members to be dropped out. And the courts in several cases, including Hema Chog versus Pritam and Harbanslal Malik, all these are various cases which have been decided by the courts. Uh, Harbanslal Malik is um, Justice Dhingra's judgment and Hema Chuk uh, Pritam is a judgment by Justice G.P. Mittal, which went on to the Supreme Court. The family members were asked to be dropped out. There are several other cases. As far as he's concerned, he was in a domestic relationship. So the case against him can continue on the other force which is if you leave out 17 and you leave out 19, he, she can still ask for maintenance, she can ask for child custody, she can ask for uh, protection orders under 20, 23. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is by Devashi. She asks if there is any limitation period for filing a complaint under the DV Act. So this is a question of which I don't really have the best answer. In a judgment in Indajit by the Supreme Court, Supreme Court notices one line and says that this case has been filed late, it's beyond one year, and therefore the question would be, is this an aspect of limitation? Now, because the court virtually treats it like a criminal case, but now subsequently the courts have treated these as civil cases. Now, as you know, in cases pertaining to women and women's issues, the courts have extended the limitation as if it's an ongoing cause of action. So the issue is still open. Would somebody be able to say, I left the domestic home three years ago. There is no domestic relationship. Under the civil law, most remedies are finished at the end of three years limitation. Why should this continue? But it's still an open-ended, apart from the judgment of Indajit, where Supreme Court says one year seems to be the limitation, but doesn't give a final lid on it. Uh, and now that it is taken as a civil remedy, this issue is still something which to, is to be adjudicated. We file cases. We keep saying it's barred by limitation. Courts have to still decide on this issue. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is interesting. It says that what if after the act of domestic violence, the parties again start to stay together? Does that condone the act or the husband can be still prosecuted for the old domestic violence incident, not the new ones? So this, um, as you said, is interesting. It's uh, like... Uh, take a case of civil cruelty or a divorce case of cruelty. If a couple starts living together or take a case of desertion, if the person starts cohabiting together, then normally it's deemed to be condoned. So, so according to me, if you start living together, then it would be taken that you have condoned or that there was no domestic violence. And then if you separate, then the domestic violence would revive. You okay. can't then come back and say, because we went back together, therefore the old one is washed off. So the sword is still hanging. We can't get rid of it. So man, we have the next question by Parul. She asks that, what if a man hides his income? The income affidavit is not clear or otherwise. How will the maintenance be calculated in that scenario? So, um, uh, as most judgments have said, an income of a person, most courts would have to do it by guesswork. 
And that's why the Supreme Court has normally said that if you're taking the income in a country like India, where there will be undisclosed income except for those in government jobs or that kind of salaried employment where there will be no suppression of income, there is possibility of suppression. There will be many judgments where the courts don't even come to a tentative income and then grant, we are granting 50,000, we are granting 25,000 without coming to a tentative income, which, the, which is actually legally incorrect because even if you're doing by guesswork and awarding a one fourth or a one third or a one fifth, whatever you may be awarding, it cannot be that it can be in the air. So some with guesswork, with suppression, but one must also remember the counter that most people will allege suppression. So then you will have to take their lifestyle and status into account. This is where Kusum Lata becomes useful. Uh, whatever be its legality, what car you drive, what mobile you use, what alcohol you drink, etc., etc. Now, how much truth emerges, we don't know out of that. But the fact is, the attempt is to determine status. And once you determine status, based on status, based on whether you have a driver, you don't have a driver, whether you have domestic help, you don't, what car you drive, what clubs you visit, etc., etc., or whether you travel, foreign travel, what class, what class not, you try and come to an approximate income and then determine, say, one third to one fourth or up to half if you go by whatever, Anurita, depending on that whole uh, whole umbrella of... Yes, ma'am. Um, and the next question is, uh, are there any, just in addition to this, by Preeti, which says, uh, any repercussions of a man concealing income, like the actions enumerated for the woman in the Madhya Pradesh High Court or the Supreme Court judgments? What are the repercussions of such acts? So I think the repercussions in practice are normally uh, uh, worse in the sense that if a court is able to surmise he has suppressed his income, then the court would then look uh, at him with very uh, questioning eyes. But having said that, uh, it should be a clear proof of suppression. A person living in a four-storied house can't say, that I'm sorry, my living expenses are only 20,000. I mean, clear suppression is there. But it's, it's your lifestyle. You, your lifestyle will, rep, will reflect, are you being truthful or are you suppressing? And if you are suppressing, to my mind, a court should be very heavy with such a person should come on strong. Um, and the next question is, uh, what is the, this actually I'm interested in, what is the sanctity of the protection officer's report, which is submitted before the MM usually? So the MM looks at it very positively, but my own view is that it is so averagely researched. They don't get into the depth of the matter they take a status report or they just summarily, many of them are not even very well qualified. So the thing is that they don't, uh, you, what you need is a kind of home study like you do in the adoption cases. When, you, uh, when the CWC or CARA gives guidelines for child adoption and home study, the home study is a real home study. It goes to that premise, it talks to the people, it talks to neighbors, it um, tries to see are these parents going to be good parents for future. But the kind of protection officer's report 
is a very perfunctory report. It has a very laudatory object, but so far it's perfunctory according to me. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is by Snigda. It says that if the wife commits adultery, is the husband still bound to give maintenance, part A, and the second part is, who will in that case get the custody of the child? So, um, the first part, should a husband have to give maintenance to a wife in adultery? Uh, to my mind, uh, not. But the courts have had a slightly different view. 125.4 is of the CRPC is clear that you should not be granting maintenance. You shouldn't be looking at granting interim and you should finally adjudicate the matter. Section 24, the earlier judgments envisage that if there is some strong indication of adultery, then the courts were slow in giving maintenance. Over the years, what started happening was that everyone started making this allegation of adultery. Then the courts saw this as a ruse not to pay maintenance. So then the court said, till it's finally adjudicated, maintenance, interim maintenance should be given. Now about final maintenance, even then courts are giving some maintenance. My view is that if indeed there is a strong allegation of adultery, which is proven adultery thereafter, maintenance should not be given because it's the same principle. A wrongdoer should not get relief. And it's only in India that we give maintenance even if someone's lived together for one day. In uh, many other countries, the period of living together, the length of living together becomes an important factor. Because are you being really a spouse or have you had a breakup from the inception? So there are many aspects. In India, you can't do it because there's also arranged marriage. There's also cheating in the arranged marriage right at the inception. So you can't really make what is good for them as a good for us. But still, I believe courts should weigh all this into and take it into account. You're absolutely right, ma'am. We can't really decipher those things in India, at least at this stage. Uh, the next question is by Sonal. Uh, it is. Uh, oh, you also asked about child custody on this. Yes, ma'am. Ma yes, ma'am. So, child custody, I don't think it should be too badly affected by adultery. It may be slightly affected, but a person may be a good parent, even if they are in another relationship as long as it's not impacting the child adversely. So all that you can do is that you can give the non-custodial parent meaningful custody, good custody, so, so that the child has the value system intact. But without seeing how it is, I don't, I mean, I can't say in a straight jacket, you are in adultery, no custody. That I would say. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the next question is by Sonal. Uh, she asks, what are the remedies available to the relatives of a husband who are unnecessarily robed in or made a party in a complaint in a section 12? So, if you are living with the man or you've been living with the husband, even say 30%, 40%, 50%, then you would be considered in a domestic relationship in a shared household. If you not live with them, as I referred, Harbans Lal Malik is there, Pritam, Pritam, whatever, Himachu versus Pritam are there. There are lots of judgments. They say they shouldn't be parties. And I feel the courts have to decide this at the threshold to throw out anybody who has been roped in, who has not been in a domestic relationship, in a shared household with the couple. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the next question is by Rohan. He asks, 
uh, if you can shed some light on cases where the wife falsely files a case against the husband and the family members for property what happens then and we we see so many of these cases that the wife threatens that she either file dv or she files dv because she wants a part in the property or a partition in the property what do we do in such cases so um so this is as i discussed in the ppt if it's a house belonging exclusively to the parents in law then the wife has no right in it if it's a house in which so it should have either been a house in which is a matrimonial home then she can have at best a right of residence till the marriage is alive and after the marriage is over the wife has no right even in the husband's property or in her parents in law property but in the parent in law's property she has no right at all except the matrimonial home right and that if the husband has not changed the matrimonial home and has not done it very colorful exercise now assume there are several cases which are filed where a wife may say that this was joint family property of my husband and it's really not joint family but she files it so there are two three judgments i think one is by justice jant not very recently about a year ago and one is by justice valmiki mehta both are relevant judgments they basically say you just can't say it's a joint family property you have to bring something on the table to say it's joint family property yes, so you sir. can't just be filing and even if they file at best the case should should live till its evidence is determined but um, they should not be stays granted for the those family members to deal with the property in the manner which they would like thank you mandeep three more questions uh one is is there any limitation running from the date of separation under 125 no no it's um 125 basically there is no limitation because you have a cause of action uh if if you're not getting maintenance and if you are destitute and unable to maintain yourself the <clears throat> the manner in which the courts have normally dealt with it is if you file under hama for example you would file for 3 years before for maintenance up to 3 years before most maintenance when granted are from the date of your petition most courts do not grant maintenance from before the filing of the petition and then in 125 is some a uh, strange thing that you file execution you file for one year at a time or something like that so the question is is there a limitation there is no limitation the courts will grant maintenance either from the date of your application or the date of the award uh unless somebody is being dilatory i know in one of my cases i recall justice dhingra saying that for the interregnum when the other side was guilty of delay he was suspending the maintenance very few courts do that but that is something which is important to avoid delay if one or the other party is being unduly dilatory then that should be the consequence that should uh, that should uh, be you know yes, foisted on them Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the next question is by Raghav from Lawyers Club. He asks, ma'am, if you could shed some light on the Section 15 of the HMA, since there is a controversy on whether a person can marry, remarry, sorry, when there is an option of appeal with the husband. So you can't remarry. Uh, you can't remarry till the appeal is listed. Now, if uh, now that the family courts act has come into force the period of appeal gets extended rather than 30 days plus certified copy so now i think it's 90 days or something plus certified copy 
till the appeal is adjudicated, you can't, you, you, no, most courts will give you a stay in any case. What if you file beyond the limitation, beyond the appeal? Because in HMA, you get a copy of the decree along, uh, free of cost immediately, uh, whenever the judgment's done. So even then, the time taken for judgment and decree and the limitation, which is now because of the Family Courts Act, I think 19, it gets extended. Otherwise, it was 30 days plus a peak period. Now, if somebody marries after that, but an appeal is not filed during that period. Suppose somebody files an appeal 20 days late with a condonation. And you, the other person gets married in that 20-day period. According to me, then there is no remedy then they have a right to get married. Many people ask for condonation, they ask for stays, but according to me, if somebody has already got married and you haven't appealed within time, then clearly your, your remedy is bad. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, one question from Preeti. She asks, husband uh, in collision with the mother sells the matrimonial house in name of the, so transfer the matrimonial house, collect the question, transfer the matrimonial house in name of the mother in apprehension of a legal action by the wife, leaving the wife and children shelterless. What is the remedy in such cases? Is there any remedy available? Since, um, so this is, um, is a difficult issue. Is the same issue where Ma'am, uh, I'm sorry to interject. Uh, Preeti has collected the question. She says the house was initially in the name of the mother. The mother sells it. And the DV was initiated after the sale of the matrimonial house. What happens then? So, uh, she may, they may not. So, was it the matrimonial home at the time when she, uh, I mean, did it continue to be the home uh, or had it, has she, yes, had she and the husband moved somewhere else? It was the matrimonial home, even at that point of time. She says yes to it. So, so probably the best would be asking for alternate relief under 19 because um, if it was the husband's property and it's a gratuitous transfer, then maybe she would have had remedies under the TPA or something. But here, if the mother-in-law sold the matrimonial home and it's actually a sale deed, then third party without notice may not be, you, civil law remedies of the third party will kick in. So the best remedy is 19 that the wife should ask for an alternate accommodation equivalent to the matrimonial home uh, that she had. And uh, the courts should uh, make sure that she gets that. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, we'll take a last question. This one is interesting. It says, uh, the DV Act, as you said, exclusively provides for women, but there have been various instances wherein the women have misused her rights their rights and under various umbrellas of law. As you said that India is still not at the situation to equalize the acts, but how would like, how, what kind of solution can you offer to this issue wherein the fake feminism, misuse of these rights, you know, uh, links to the real victims? Like what do we do in such cases? So this is difficult uh, because um, most DV courts used to originally sit with the ethos that they have to provide somehow the other relief to the girl. Slowly, I'm seeing a change. Courts are becoming very conscious where they find that the women are misusing the law and are abusing it. India is still, because the power equation between women and men is so unequal, in India, still, we are grappling with the issue. But in many other countries, I see the courts have been coming very heavy in case there is a misuse of law. In India, it is still slow because the power balance is that much more unequal. 
But having said that, where the courts see that someone is misusing authority, the courts should be equally quick in nipping it in the bud. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It has been overwhelming for us. It has been extremely academic also, and everyone's understood, I feel, various aspects of domestic violence. As discussed with you, we'll take up the other webinars and we'll keep you updated about those. So we have an upcoming webinar with uh, Geeta Ma'am itself on the 29th of this month, in which we'll take up some live questions as to a career in criminal law and Mostly the topic has been chosen by some of our uh, women in the team, which basically would say, how can women excel in law, especially criminal law, because that has been a hot debated topic all the time when it comes to practice of criminal law. So we'd like, uh, love to take those questions with ma'am on the 29th. So we'll take you, uh, keep you updated. And ma'am will also speak uh, with us on a topic on arbitration sometime in the first week of April, since she's also uh, a member with the ICA. So she'll take up those questions as well. Thank you, everyone. And just a few announcements. Uh, we have another webinar tomorrow at 4 p.m. on commercial mediation and one on Tuesday with Pascal on negotiations, which is how to deal with how high conflict individuals in negotiations. That will be helpful for everyone, especially when you deal with mediations when they come out of DV. So he's a family mediator. I would ask all of you to join. And the third that we have planned already is all of you who have at one point of time thought of doing a master's or are planning a master's or any kind of you know foreign work. So we'll have a professor from UC Berkeley, a dear friend of mine, who will take up those live Q&A with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. It's wonderful you. having you. Thank you.